Welcome to IndyCar Airlines, flight 12, originating from Cleveland's Burke Lakefront Airport. Please fasten your seat belts. This flight will be fast. We also expect to encounter some heavy turbulence. Please extinguish all smoking materials. Once in flight, smoking is permitted, but not recommended. We ask you remain seated throughout the duration of takeoff and landing. Thank you for choosing IndyCar Airlines. We invite you to join us in the cockpit for a spectacular view. Now prepare for takeoff. The Burke Lakefront Airport in Cleveland, Ohio is arguably one of IndyCar's most iconic tracks and one that fans wish was still on the schedule to this day. There was a lot of iconic races over the years, but in this video we'll be focusing on the 1995 edition of the Cleveland Grand Prix. The late Gilles de Ferran was a rookie in 1995 and he claimed his first ever kart pole in this race with a new track record of 58.328 seconds and an average speed of 146.2 miles an hour. Jacques Villeneuve would start alongside Gilles de Ferran and the race was scheduled for 90 laps. As the field lines up with this rookie pole sitter in the bright yellow car, Jill DeFerrin. And the concern here, of course, is that turn one because it can be so very quick and so very wide and we've seen them pull out and try any kind of line. So as they come, we've got a spin already as we came off of one of those areas that we told you was a matter of concern. We're not even getting to turn one before an incident. Right? Nevertheless, they went green flag. They're through turn one, we're racing. But the field badly broken up as they came through turn one. Tracy Ribeiro Pruitt all appear to be part of that incident. And Tracy's back running again. Andre Ribeiro and Scott Pruitt are both still sitting on the race course. Now Andre Ribeiro is off the edge. Here it is. Tracy, who has been really charging forward in the past couple of races, was charging again and got together with Ribeiro. It's amazing to have that happen in turn three or in the row three and row four, that mid, you know, section of it to have it happen there. But I think I read a quote where Tracy said he really had to get to the front uh, because he didn't qualify as well as he expected. So he really jumped too soon. Well, Paul Tracy got it back moving again. The IndyCar safety crew has managed to get Scott Pruitt over off the left side of the course and they're trying to get him going before the rest of the field came around. But the field is now passing that section and Jill DeFerrin followed by Jack Villeneuve leads the first lap. Teo Fabi comes across in third and then Brian Herta followed by Michael Andretti and Robbie Gordon, Mauricio Guzman. Here's the crash involving Paul Tracy. Now they're still on the pace lap at this point through a right-hander then a left-hander. Green's not yet out. He caught him just coming off of that last turn. That makes you wonder about the alignment on Paul Tracy's car. Clearly uh, that uh, front right wheel really came in contact hard. Usually in Cleveland it's trouble down into turn one, but this time we had trouble before we even got to the start finish line as Andre Ribeiro and Paul Tracy made contact. From that onboard shot, Andre Ribeiro did not leave Paul Tracy a lot of room, so this is a rare occasion where I'll give Paul Tracy the benefit of the doubt. But in typical cart 90s fashion, despite Andre Ribeiro still sitting there after a couple of laps, the cart officials elected to not throw a full course caution even though his car was kind of sitting in a pretty dangerous area, he would retire and finish in the 27th position. While Paul Tracy and Scott Pruitt, who also had some damage, managed to continue on. After all that excitement on the initial start of the race, things seemed to settle in. Paul Tracy was still on the lead lap, but Michael Andretti began putting immense pressure on Robbie Gordon for the fifth position. So much so that Michael was able to force Robbie Gordon into a mistake where he had to cut the course in turns three and four, giving Michael Andretti the position. All right, here's what just happened is Robbie Gordon got past Michael Andretti, picked up fifth place, and almost immediately got himself in trouble. Way too hot to that corner, would you say? Paul Tracy would find trouble again on lap 17 as he would go for a spin and end up stalling his engine, needing help to be refired. Here it is, Lynn. Very close uh, following Cheever, but it doesn't look like Cheever really slowed him down. I don't know, unless the Cheever slowed down and he was carrying more momentum and he spun to avoid rear-ending Cheever. But, another, another view, oh, Sam. He, no, yeah, he lost it uh, before that, so. You can see he kept the foot in the throttle, tried to snap it around. I'm surprised he stalled it. That was bad luck. He was running 17th at the time. This puts paid to any chance he might have. There's Sullivan 
almost the same place. I was going to say that Tracy really has no chance now to win the championship. The very next lap, Danny Sullivan would go for a spin, but he was fortunate enough to keep his car rolling, and he would continue on without any further issues or damage. Paul Tracy, on the other hand, would get his car re-fired and he would make it back to pit road, where he would end up getting out of the car and retiring due to handling issues caused by damage on that first lap incident. On lap 23, we would get our next set of retirements with Christian Fittipaldi who came to a rest at the entrance of Pitt Road with a blown engine, and his uncle Emerson Fittipaldi who actually made it back to the pits but would end up retiring with a mechanical issue of his own. With a problem with the water system that caused water to leak out of the side pods of his car. Despite this, we still would not see a full course caution as they were able to pull Christian Fittipaldi's car through the gap in the wall that the safety workers use. On lap 28, we would see our first green flag pit stops as the leader Gilles de Ferrin would hit pit road, giving the lead to Jacques Villeneuve. Villeneuve, who is the current championship leader of the kart series, would lead three laps before he too would hit pit road, giving the lead to Tio Fabi, who would pit on the very next lap, completing the cycle of green flag pit stops and handing the lead back to rookie Gilles de Ferrin. On lap 36, we would get our next retirement of the race as Mauricio Guzelman would lose fuel pressure in his pack West Reynard Ford, and he would come to a stop on the track, putting an end to his race. Despite Robbie Gordon's little off track earlier in the race, he did have very good pace in that car as he began to put pressure on Jacques Villeneuve to come after the fifth spot. He would dive bomb into turn number one, take the position, but Villeneuve would come back at him on the inside going into turn number three, where both of them would find themselves in trouble and going off the racetrack. And Robbie, hey, get it back together it. again. Let's Thank go at it again. Good. He's off too. Keep it going. Keep it going. Thankfully, both drivers were able to easily continue on without any major issues. Robbie Gordon with Jack, and they both get into the corner hunt. There's plenty of room here. This is a personality thing. Robbie pushing Gio and uh, Jock, and Jock having none of it. Boy, that is, I am going to take this corner first, and you're not, and they were willing to go off the road to make their point. One look, against the other, and boy, Robbie, you know, off-road he likes. Look I at can't that. Look at him try to intimidate Jock. Yeah. Is yeah. this also an issue, though, of where they can't pick up their marks going into a corner? Well, that's true, but they were still working. They were both concerned about each other. Look at that. Is that incredible? As they continue right on it. And there it is. Good Robbie Gordon job. Good. Takes him right back. Great pass, great pass. Let's get after Andretti now and hurt it. Come on, let's get after them. As you can see, it didn't take long for Robbie Gordon to get that move done on Jacques Villeneuve, as Villeneuve just didn't seem to have the pace at this point in the race and was slipping back through the order. On lap 60, leader Gilles de Ferrin would come in and kick off the second round of green flag pit stops of the race. To this point, Gilles de Ferrin has pretty much looked untouchable with clearly the most dominant car. But with that being said, Tio Fabi was keeping him in check and not too far behind. Tio Fabi would end up staying out slightly longer than Gilles de Ferrin, and when he would come in to make his green flag pit stop, his team very precisely calculated the amount of fuel that he needed to make it to the end of the race. So when he did come in for a pit stop, it was a timed one, which allowed him to have a much quicker pit stop than Gilles de Ferrin, and when he would come out of the pits, he would be in the lead of the race by a few seconds and look to be in firm position to win this race and steal it away from Gilles de Ferrin. However, that would not be the case unfortunately, as Tio Fabi was leaving his pit stall, he left quite aggressively, peeling out, and he would actually end up cracking a header in the engine, leading him to be slightly off the pace on his outlap and he would immediately come down pit road and end up retiring from the race. This is quite unfortunate and definitely one of those what might have been moments as Tio Fabi has five career kart wins but he hasn't won since 1989 and 1995 would actually end up being his last full-time season in the kart series. 
as he would never score another victory. Just a couple of laps prior to Tio Fabi's retirement, Raul Boizel would also have to pull off to the side of the track and would need to be pulled back to the pit area as his car came to a halt with an electrical problem, putting an end to his race. This would put Gilles de Ferrin back in control of this race as he's led well over 60 laps to this point. However, the whole complexion of this race was about to change as we would finally get our first full course caution. Back at the Burke Lakefront Airport in Cleveland, Eric Bachelor walks away from having spun and backed his cars into the tires. There's his car as it ended up in the tires, and here's how he got there. Robbie Gordon just circled around, and that's that trouble area we identified earlier on to you, and he just backed her on in. Looks like he really didn't have any problem there. Gave Robbie enough room to go around, but he must, there's marbles out there. They're starting to gather out there, and I think he must have gotten the marbles, had no traction to be able to get around the He corner. gave Robbie too much room. There you go, he got it offline, gave him way too much room. The yellow would last for six laps, but maybe they should have waited one lap longer, as the already crazy restarts at Cleveland would get even crazier with a jet dryer still on the racetrack, trying desperately to get out of the way as the green flag flies. Back green pole, Thankfully there was no major catastrophe going into turn number one with that jet dryer still on the track or contact among competitors. Robbie Gordon who's been super aggressive tried to make the dive bomb for the lead but did not come out on the proper end of it and he would try to do the exact same thing again on the very next lap. Look at this now, well, look at Robbie, he tries it on the inside again, they both circle around. Come on, get it up, get it up. He's going to fight flat one on her, he's right on your tail. Come on, let's get going, get up, Mr. Barrett. The aggressive move would end up gift wrapping Michael Andretti the lead of the race as he began to pull away in the closing stages, knocking Gilles de Ferrin back to third. And unfortunately for Robbie Gordon, his chances of a victory would come to an end here as he would make contact with another car and end up cutting his left rear tire, forcing him to pit. Michael Andretti was trying desperately to hold the rest of the field at bay and with coming to five laps to go, the race would take a huge turning point. Look at this, Gilda oh, Farron moves down to the here. inside. Gilda Farron to the inside takes Michael there off and charges on Bill now. De Farron is in trouble. De Farron gets is. pushed off, gets tangled with Scott Bruin. De Farron's day appears to be over. Michael has the lead solidly now. He had just gotten past Michael and he is trying to get them to get his car back going. That's Luke DeFerrin, his father, he can't believe it. As DeFerrin has run into trouble in other races, very late in the game, so has he here again. This is the fight for second, as Hurd and Villeneuve go wheel to wheel, two corners now. Is this gonna end up in trouble? As Gilles DeFerrin was trying to retake the lead of the race in the closing stages, he would make contact with Scott Pruitt and both of them would go off into the tire barriers, ending Gilles DeFerrin's day in hopes for a victory. He was visibly upset here as Scott Pruitt was a lap down and not fighting for the lead here. Gilles also clearly had the most dominant car and led the most laps in this race by far, leading 67 of the 90 laps as this would end up giving Michael Andretti a huge gift once again as he was able to stretch his lead out and it was looking like he might be able to close this one out and win. Before this one would close out though, we would see one more retirement due to mechanical failure as Adrian Fernandez, who was having a pretty solid day and was on his way to getting a good finish with everything that happened in this one, his engine would expire with only a few laps left, putting an end to his race. As this race approached the final lap, once again, Michael Andretti's lead would evaporate and things would get wild as the white flag would come out. Here comes Herta as he makes his move on Michael and he's got him with two laps to go. But no! Michael but comes he... back as Herta falters! But look at Villeneuve! The white flag comes out! Villeneuve comes in on the charge! The white flag is out! Two miles to go! One lap as Villeneuve moves for the lead! Unbelievable. Herta tries to play catch up now. 
just to shift. That's why he dropped suddenly back. Final set of corners now for these two. Jack Belknap has it, but Herta now has the challenge. Can he come up and close on Belknap? This is Belknap's canniest race. He's driven great races all year. This is his smartest, most patient, and he will extend his championship. Quick little straightaway ahead. Jack Belknap, and then Brian Herta as Belknap screams for the checkered flag. What an incredible finish as Jacques Villeneuve, who just didn't seem like he had a car to win during this race, but was consistently up at the front and put himself in the right position to steal the victory as Michael Andretti was lacking pace in the closing stages here, trying desperately to hold on to the lead. And Brian Herta unfortunately made a mistake here as he thought he passed Michael under the yellow flag that was still out for Gilles de Ferran's car, but that was not the case and it ended up costing him the victory. Well, that's going to do it for today's video. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you like IndyCar history and other motorsports related history videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And if you enjoyed this one, give it a thumbs up. That's all for now, and I hope to see you guys in my next video. Take care, everybody.